Now, it's a fact that there's nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this house, except that it's very large. Also that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy as any man in the city of London. And yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock, sees in the knocker without its undergoing any intermediate process of change. Not a knocker, but Marley's face. not angry or ferocious, but it looks at Scrooge just exactly as Marley used to look, with his ghastly, ghostly spectacles turned up upon his ghastly forehead. As Scrooge looks fixedly at this phenomenon, it's a knocker again. Poo poo, he cries. He closes the door with a bang. Sound resounds through the house like thunder, but Scrooge is not a man to be frightened by echoes. He closes the door, walks across the hall and up the stairs. Slowly, too, trimming his candle as he goes. Up Scrooge goes, not caring a button, for it's being very dark. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he closes his own room door, he walks through his apartments to see that all is right. He has just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Bedroom, sitting room, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate with spoon and basin ready and a little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge has a cold in the head upon the hob. <sighs> Quite satisfied. He closes on his own door and locks himself in. Double locks himself in, which is not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he takes off his cravat, puts on his dressing gown and slippers and sits down beside the very low fire to take his gruel. As he throws his head back in his chair, His glance happens to rest upon a bell, a disused bell. It hangs in the corner of the room and communicates for some purpose now forgotten with the chamber in the highest story of the building. It's with a strange and inexplicable dread that as he looks at it, the bell begins to swing. Ah! Soon it rings out loudly, together with every bell in the house. And then he hears a clanking noise deep down below as though somebody is dragging a chain over the casks in the wine mounts merchant cellar and then he hears the noise much louder upon the floors below then come coming up the stairs and then coming straight towards his door and it comes on through the door and the spectre passing passes into the room and upon its coming in, the dying flame leaps up as though it cried out. I know him. Marley's ghost. Same face, the very same Marley in his usual pigtail, waistcoat, tights and boots. His body is transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, can see the two buttons on his coat. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he'd never believed it until then. No. Nor does he believe it even now. Now he feels the chilling influence of his death-cold eyes, and he notices the very texture of the kerchief bound about its chin. He is still incredulous. How now, says Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Much? Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who are you then? In life? I was your partner, Jacob Marley. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You might be an undigested bit of beef, blot of mustard, crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of the gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge is not in the habit of cracking jokes. Nor does he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is he tries to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention, keeping down his horror. But how much greater is his horror when the phantom taking off the kerchief bound about its head and chin, as though it was to wear, warm to wear indoors. Its lower jaw drops down upon its breast. Oh, mercy, dreadful apparition. Why do you come to me? Why do spirits walk abroad and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do though after death. I cannot tell you all I would. A very little more is permitted to me. In life, my spirit never ranged beyond the narrow limits of our money changing home and we. You were always a good man, business, Jacob. Business. Oh, business. Mankind was my business. Mercy, forbearance, charity, benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Why did I walk through crowds of my fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never once raised them to that blessed star which leads the white man to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which his light would have guided me? Hear me. My time is nearly gone. I will... But don't be hard upon me, Jacob. Don't be flowery, pray. I'm here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. Oh, you always were a good friend to me, thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? I, I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. Expect the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look. 
for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. Walks backwards from him. And at every step it takes, the window raises itself a little, so that when the apparition reaches it, it is wide open. And he floats out through the self-opened window into the bleak dark night. Scrooge closes the window and examines the door by which the ghost has entered. It's double locked and the bolts are undisturbed. Scrooge tries to say humbug, but he sticks at the first syllable, hum. And being and the emotions of the evening, the lateness and the hour, the dull conversation of the ghost, much in need of repose. He goes straight to bed without getting undressed and falls asleep upon the instant.